fun. And so for everyone to know, we are now live streaming on the YouTube channel as well. Um, and we are recording this. This uh, presentation will be available on the YouTube channel now live and then afterwards as a recording. And we're so glad to have all of you with us today. Welcome to our first webinar on the road to mission science. This program is facilitated by the Lunar and Planetary Institute with both inspiration and support from the ChemCam instrument on the Mars Curiosity rover. So today we're going to be talking with four different planetary scientists and engineers to hear about their career paths and their recommendations for students. Now, we'll also be sharing out a variety of opportunities and other resources. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming our speakers. And in no particular order, um, the first one, uh, Dr. Horton Newsom at the University of New Mexico, who is a co-investigator and a science team member on the ChemCam instrument. That's on the Mars Science Lab Curiosity rover. Uh, Horton has also been involved in several Mars uh, missions. Um, Dr. Herman Martinez, is a staff scientist here at the Lunar and Planetary Institute, who is part of both the Mars Science Laboratory mission, Curiosity, and the Mars 2020 Perseverance mission. Um, Dr. Alice Korokos is a physicist and engineer at the Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratory, and she's working on NASA's Dragonfly mission, which is going to be visiting Saturn's moon Titan. Woo! And Dr. Tim Livengood is a research scientist at NASA Goddard, studied many different planetary bodies and is looking for water on the moon. Um, so um, let's see, Grace, I think the plan was to start off by inviting each of them to say a little bit about themselves, yes? Actually, um, if we can do a couple of polls first and then we'll Absolutely. go back to the slides. I think that sounds like a brilliant idea. Fabulous. We want to learn more about everyone else who's here. University of Houston, Clear Lake, right next door to us. Um, people from all over the place. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead. We've got a poll here. We want to learn a little bit more about everyone who's here with us today. Um, so there's two questions here. The first one is your academic level. Are you a high school student? That's um, you know, ninth through 12th grade. Are you an undergraduate student at a college or university? Are you a graduate student right now um, pursuing either a master's or a PhD, um, but you're at a university? Um, are you a recent graduate of any type, but you're, you're done right now with uh, being a student? Are you a postdoctoral fellow someplace, still studying, still learning? We all are still learning though, right? All of us are students of, of something or another or something else completely different. Um, you are welcome to enter some details in the chat. And then also uh, the second question there is, what is your area of focus or interest? Planetary science is very um, multidisciplinary, right, Grace? Mm -hmm. So some of you might be studying, you know, planetary geology, you might be studying astronomy or physics, chemistry, um, earth science, engineering, um, computer science, are you in business or arts or humanities or something else completely different. So um, let's go ahead and give everybody five more seconds to finish hitting enter on the polls and some of you are entering it in the chat and that's also great to hear. Well, stellar science. I would put stellar science under space science. The very first one, space science encompasses many things, right? Includes astronomy, stellar science, um, um, but could also include planetary sciences in many ways as well, especially planetary geodynamics or something. And five, four, three, oh. two, one. Let's go ahead and let's stop sharing here. And um, let's let everybody see. So um, the majority of you are, are graduate students, but a good percentage, a quarter of you are undergraduates. We've got a few high school students here as well. And we've got a few uh, postdoctoral uh, fellows as well, some recent graduates. So we're a little bit all over the place with the majority of you being graduate students. Um, and then in terms of what you're studying right now, the majority of you are studying some sort of space science, but we also have several, about a third that are studying earth science. Uh, that could be meteorology, oceanography, or geology, or many things. Some of you are life science or health science. A, a number of you uh, are, are engineering and computer science and a variety of others. So we're gonna stop sharing that. And um, 
Okay. Uh, and I'm launching the next set of polls that is asking about your research experiences. So we just want to get an idea of if you've conducted research before, since most of you are graduate students, probably you have. And if you are currently looking for opportunities, or maybe you're kind of taking a break or not at that place right now, and which factors are most important to you in pursuing a research opportunity. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list, just some ideas, and um, feel free to add anything to the chat if you have more to say. All right, thanks for your participation. I'm gonna shut the poll down in <laughs> three, two, and one. Okay, I'm gonna show the results. So most of you have participated in research, that's awesome. Um, and you are currently looking for research opportunities, that's great. And let's see, so the most important thing to all of us, right, is our personal interest in the topic. But other things that matter are having access to a peer, to mentors, and of course being um, compensated and having variety. So feel free to add other things if you have more thoughts, but that's it for the polls right now. Thank you for participating. And Grace, I think, is it time now to let our scientists talk a little bit about themselves? Um, yes, absolutely. So I'm gonna bring our slides back up. Okay, and first up is Tim. Okay, hi, I'm uh, uh, Tim Livengood, uh, and I'm an associate research scientist in the Department of Astronomy at University of Maryland. I am mostly a ground-based astronomer. Uh, I got started in the field uh, working with a uh, space telescope called the International Ultraviolet Explorer, uh, or IUE as a guest observer, uh, first as a graduate student. Uh, so my, my thesis advisor, Warren Moose, was the uh, principal investigator, and then I just did the, all the work. Uh, and then later on, I was a PI in my own right. Um, but when I moved to uh, working at Goddard Space Flight Center, I moved into uh, infrared astronomy, which at the time was, uh, well, it's still mostly done from the ground, but there is a continuing development in infrared instrumentation for space. And uh, in the picture that I have here, this is at the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility in Hawaii uh, with two of my colleagues, both of whom are actually retired now. Uh, Ted Kostiuk, who got the instruction that we were supposed to look at the sky, uh, who created this instrument called HIPWAC, and John Kolosinski, who apparently was listening to a different memo uh, and is looking at the camera, and of course, uh, me back there. Since then, or actually mixed in with that work, I also got involved with uh, the epoxy extended mission for the Deep Impact spacecraft. Uh, Deep Impact uh, fulfilled its name by having an impactor that let a comet run over it because uh, the comet was moving faster. And, uh, and uh, because some people I'm sure want to know, uh, they had the name before the movie, uh, but the movie had more money invested, so they actually did have to sign a memorandum of agree understanding as to how each organization was going to use the name Deep Impact. Uh, but then later on, uh, with the extended mission, we, uh, we mixed together two different components, the uh, Dixie Deep Impact Extended Investigation, then the part I was on, EPOC, Extrasolar Planet Observation and Characterization. And you mix your components and you get epoxy. Uh, and then finally, I joined the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter team, uh, specifically with the Lunar Exploration Neutron Detector some years ago, uh, which uh, paid off weirdly because my, my summer job when I was an undergraduate student was, just a second, my summer job was measuring radiation exposure of uh, biological samples, including, as it happened, uh, the occasional primate for which we had to make what was called a monkey phantom, uh, where I used this to make a mold that we cast tissue equivalent wax in. So one of the points that uh, I like to hit is that learning is never wasted. Even if you're learning about something that seems unrelated to what you're working on actively at the time, 
you know, 30 years later, 30, yeah, well, yeah, 25 years after I did that, uh, I had a need to use the skills I developed in measuring radiation exposure uh, in order to start working on measuring neutron flux emerging from the moon and understanding how to use that to interpret how much water is buried uh, beneath the lunar surface. I've got my, my email over here, uh, University of Maryland, T. Livingo. Uh, and on Facebook, I exist under my real name. Uh, I probably will not become a Facebook friend with you. I'm not allowed to have that many Facebook friends. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can, you can find me there. Thank you so much. And Sarah said that it sounds like the name Epoxy really stuck. Ha uh ha. -huh. Oh, we have more puns than that. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Tim. Next up we have, we move back over here. We have Herman. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for participating here. Um, I'm very honored that you are interested in people like me. So hopefully I'll, I'll be of a help for you guys. Uh, so I'll start from the beginning. Uh, so, or wait, I'll start from the end. Uh, currently I'm a research scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, Texas. Uh, but I started my career in space science like 20 years ago back in Spain. Uh, I studied physics in, in, in Madrid and uh, literally when I was an undergrad in my last year, uh, my professor, uh, and I had no idea that he was involved with NASA, but uh, he contacted me and, and told me, hey, Germán, I'm the principal investigator uh, in a NASA mission in Mars Science Laboratory. Uh, I'm developing the weather uh, instrument on MSL. Do you want to take the PhD with me? And uh, I said, yes. Um, after that, I studied a master's in Earth sciences because back in my time, uh, we didn't have any masters in space science. So uh, I had to take this masters in Earth science and at the same time do my PhD on planetary science. And um, as you can imagine, I became part of the Mars Science Laboratory mission, which is the figure on the top left. Uh, again, because I got, uh, I was lucky, you know, that my professor was this guy. Um, as part of my PhD, I was mostly in Madrid and Italy. Um, I was fortunate enough to make a lot of contacts during my PhD because, you know, like being involved in a NASA mission, like I made a lot of contacts with uh, Americans, with Europeans, with people from everywhere. Um, so once I earned my PhD, I moved to the University of Michigan. Uh, I was there like seven or eight years. And, and more recently, I, I came down to Houston and, and again, currently working at LPI. Um, I'm also uh, part of the Mars 20 and 20 mission. Uh, as you know, this is the new rover uh, that landed on Mars like a year ago. Uh, taking advantage of the experience that I gained with MSL, uh, I uh, was also, or I became part of Mars 20 and 20. Uh, again, I'm working on the meteorological station on, on, uh, on the Perseverance rover. Uh, so basically my work is like being sort of a Martian weatherman. I'm analyzing uh, most, of the, most of the time at least. I'm analyzing uh, the weather. And, and the reason I'm doing this, uh, I'd like to think, is because in 10 or 20 years, or maybe 30 or 40 years, uh, we'll go to Mars and being able to predict the weather will be very important. So we want to predict dust the storms, we want to predict where water ice is uh, to get some water once we are there. Uh, so that's a little bit what I'm doing, like analyzing the climate uh, with the idea of helping in, in future exploration. And uh, yeah, that's a summary of me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Herman. Next up is Alice. Hi, everyone. I'm Alice Kokoris. I'm a senior professional staff at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Um, and the main mission that I'm working on right now is NASA's Dragonfly mission. So for those who don't know, Dragonfly is a mission that is going to Saturn's moon Titan to look at the prebiotic chemistry 
and the habitability. Uh, not to spoil anything, but it's really, really cold there. So I don't think we're going to live there anytime soon, but it'll give us an insight to what Earth might have looked like a very, very long time ago. So I think I might be the odd one out here. I am actually, although my background is in particle physics and that's what I got my PhD in. So you can see me here in this picture at CERN. Um, I actually transitioned to engineering when, after I got my PhD and, um, and now work mostly with instruments. So I'm the LIDAR lead for the mobility team on Dragonfly. So this mission is sending an octocopter to the surface of Titan, which means we'll be doing powered flight, um, a number of flights from the, the dune area, hopefully to get to Salt Crater to explore a lot of different terrain on the surface of Titan. And in order to do that, because Titan is really, really far away from Earth, that this all has to happen autonomously. So uh, the instrument that I'm in charge of looks down at the surface and tries to make sure that we can land safely. Um, other than Dragonfly, I have spent some time doing some proposals. So I was the payload system engineer for the Interstellar Probe Mission Concept Study, which was a study commissioned by the NASA Heliophysics Science Mission Directorate to look at if we designed a spacecraft that could last for 50 years and we sent it out into the interstellar medium through, the, through our solar system, through the heliopause, uh, what, what kind of mission could we design? So I was in charge of making sure all the instruments could do what they're supposed to do. Um, so you can see my contact info here. You can see a little picture here of, of the initial entry, descent, and landing of the octocopter. So it'll come off the back chute, make its first landing all autonomously, which is terrifying, but also very exciting, and then take off and do it all over again a bunch of times. Um, and just so that you know, I'm a human too, and not just a scientist or an engineer. I spend most of my free time with my son and my husband and my dog. Outside, this is a picture of me where I grew up in Lake Tahoe, Nevada. Thank you so much, Alice. And I think we still have one more person, yes? Last but not least, we have Horton. Hi, so I'm a research professor at the uh, Institute of Meteoritics and Department of Earth and Planetary Science at the University of New Mexico. And I've been, been here for quite a while, but I was lucky enough to get involved with the PI um, of ChemCam, Roger Weens, uh, at, he was the PI at the time, uh, and, and some of our preliminary designs for rovers. And we did a Marzacod rover uh, test. And then, so I was invited to be involved with the uh, uh, write, writing the proposal for ChemCam, uh, which was accepted um, back in 2004 is when we were writing that, hard to believe. But um, uh, this is me in front of the uh, rover test bed. The test bed is, is our, a key instrument that we use to prove that all the programming works on, on the instruments that we don't send a command that's gonna break the rover. And so <clears throat> I've been working on Curiosity for, for 10 years now uh, since it landed actually, <clears throat> and doing science with my, uh, my students. And then uh, I'm also involved with Mars 2020 Perseverance. I'm, uh, I'm a, a collaborator on the SuperCam instrument on that, on that mission, but Curiosity continues to be absolutely amazing. So I have not been um, able to do as much on 2020 as I originally hoped. So just to give you an idea, we have, uh, we've had in the past quite a few people here uh, working on, on Mars stuff. Here's some of my students that, that went, went to the uh, Ninth International Mars Conference just before uh, the summer before the pandemic hit. And over here is um, one of my former students, Nina Lanza, and she's currently now the ChemCam Instrument Principal Investigator. So she had a big promotion and she's up at Los Alamos National Lab. And so that's very exciting. So she took over as uh, Roger was going to concentrate on SuperCamp. So uh, we work on, on geology and geochemistry. And my background is in, in uh, everything from <clears throat> planetary formation, uh, from a geochemical point of view, core formation on the uh, Earth and other planets, 
And then uh, I got involved in, uh, did a lot of work on impact crater science. And so we have some projects going on relating to impact craters uh, on curiosity. And, and we're gonna be doing some similar things looking at really small craters uh, in, in Jezero Crater. So it's been a lot of fun, a lot of work on, on uh, these two different missions. And uh, should just, it just looks like it's just gonna keep going on and on and on. So hopefully I'll be able to keep, keep working on things for a long time. Now, I had one more slide uh, that I put in here. And uh, this is to, for, for all of you guys. So you can start thinking about the future. And uh, this was actually a painting done uh, many, many decades ago by Chesley Bonestell, the most famous um, space art uh, person. And if you would ask people a few years ago, whether this, um, when, he, when he did this, whether these uh, layered sedimentary like rocks in, behind in this picture would be anything like we find on Mars, they would have said, oh, no way. And guess what? We're now investigating rocks that look very similar, both in uh, uh, both both in Gale Crater and Jezero Crater on Mars. So I think some of the people who are um, online uh, today with us um, may actually have the chance to go uh, in the in the future uh, to Mars and actually do this. And notice also, this is a uh, so as I said before, planetary science is a human endeavor. And uh, so this is future human exploration that we may be doing. Of course, in this time frame, we're going to be, you know, when we're still going to be probably looking at data from fire, uh, <clears throat> from Dragonfly and and these other distant missions, uh, the ones proposed for Uranus and uh, <clears throat> uh, most recently. So it's going to be an exciting, uh, exciting adventure coming up. Thank you. Thank you. And I see people right. are already entering questions. And Grace, you've got a lot of things planned for us. I was wondering if we should start off with that chat storm that we talked about. Sure. Um, I think if it's OK, I might just quickly review the resource document. Please, absolutely. So I just have one more slide for you guys to look at. So the resource document has been shared in the chat. I'll continue to share it. Um, it's available for download. It will be available for download on the a YouTube page where this recording will be and a couple other places. If you have any trouble finding it, you can email us. Um, anyway, the resource document is about 20 pages long and it contains three sections. The first of which is student opportunities, internships and fellowships. So the way that it's set up is there is the title of the program in bold and then top left tells you the organization that runs it in this case, NASA and Arizona State. On the top right is the discipline of the internship, not the discipline of someone who should apply. So some of these might say geoscience or space science. That means if you did the internship or the fellowship, that's what you'd be doing, but not necessarily what you have to like have a degree in. There's a description and then the audience that this is intended for. Um, and a deadline if it is upcoming and it's already been posted. Otherwise, the deadlines are sometimes a little vague and it just says like winter. So you'll want to check back and then each one comes with a link to check it out. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, there are probably things that I've missed. And if that's the case and you're aware of them, please send them to me so we can add this to the document. We want to compile a bunch of things. Similarly, if you find something that is no longer being run and it needs to be removed, please let us know. Um, the second section has information about um, scholarships and awards. And then the third section is information about other ways to get involved through citizen science projects or volunteering or outreach programs, things like that. So if you have any trouble finding the resource document, let us know that this is what it's got inside of it. Okay, so now I'm done with slide sharing <laughs> and we can move on to, uh, let's see, maybe a chat let's, storm and then Q&A. Let's do the chat storm and, and um, we should stipulate that, that um, the resource document that uh, Grace has put together has things uh, for a variety of different uh, grade levels uh, and, and resources and um, including internships, uh, whether you're currently a student um, and opportunities and she just put it in the chat. And some of those are for people outside of the US as well as uh, some that are restricted to people within the United States. So they vary greatly. Um, 
And the chat storm, um, we wanted to hear from all of you. So what we'd like everyone to do is to think about a challenge or an obstacle that you've had in participating in mission science here in planetary mission science. So, so um, what sort of obstacles might you be facing? Think about it and start to type, but don't hit enter. Start to type, but don't hit enter. And we're gonna give you about 15 seconds. And then when everyone is ready, we're gonna have you all hit enter, but don't hit enter yet. So start to type what obstacles you have faced in participating in planetary mission science or engineering or planetary missions in general. Um, so think about it, but don't hit enter yet. We're gonna give you 10 more seconds. Gonna give you five more seconds. And in three more seconds, we're gonna hit return. Three, two, and one. Go ahead and hit return. And that's called a, a chat storm. And so we've got finances and uh, finding opportunities, time and money, trying to move mid-career, you know, so this idea of transitioning things, difficult to enter due to the opaqueness of the process. So trying to understand what the process is, being an international student. Um, so uh, still a high school student, so you're still working on some things. You've got a, a ways to go here yet, um, potentially. Um, um, so we have a whole bunch of different ideas here that you can scroll through. Um, and people are coming from a variety of backgrounds. So hopefully some of the information that we will be sharing today will be helpful to some of you. Or some of it will be helpful to all of you. And uh, Grace, do you want to go ahead and, and share one of our first questions for our, our panelists? Oh, sure. So... We, uh, Christine and I have a couple of questions that we're gonna ask the panel, but we want to get a lot of the questions from you, the audience. So the, again, the focus of this panel is to talk about careers, getting involved, not as much about the specifics of the different science missions themselves. So we're gonna prioritize questions about academic and professional preparedness and challenges and things like that. Um, so, just to kick us off, um, let's see. I'm gonna start off with, with Horton. Um, which, which experiences or opportunities do you think were most important for you getting started? Okay, <clears throat> well, that's a very good question. I think, you know, and I've been looking through the questions and all, and I think one of the, one of the key things here is that, um, you know, during my career, it's changed from one thing to another. I spent some time, quite a bit of time doing <clears throat> more outreach related things, which is <clears throat> how I was able to get uh, LPI onto the Kim Cam mission. And, uh, and then I was lucky enough to get involved with uh, test, testing uh, on the earth, testing uh, rover uh, uh, instruments. And so then that led to being able to get on the mission. So you have to be flexible. Being flexible is the most important thing. One of my students went to work for Chevron and then went back. Another one of the, the one of the chief Mars scientists spent many years working for an oil company before going back to um, to work uh, work for NASA. So uh, being flexible and uh, enjoying what you what you're doing and and keep learning and and keeping in touch with what's happening in the areas of science that you're you're most interested in. So that you, when an opportunity does come up, you can you can actually speak intelligently about what what the opportunity is. Well, and this is a little similar to what Herman said, right? Like he hadn't intended to work on planetary science, but it was your PhD advisor, right, who got you started. Yeah, no, exactly. I I, I like the word uh, that that you use. Like you have to be flexible. I I think that's true. You know, like uh, I'm I'm pretty sure I am here today uh, because I was willing. You know, like to to leave my country or to leave my hometown. You know, like I would never be here if I hadn't gone from my hometown to Madrid, Spain. Uh, then I went to Italy because you know, like uh, there was a, an opportunity to get better trained. 
Uh, then I went to Norway also because, you know, and I was like growing up in each step. After that, I, I left Europe and moved to the U.S. And it was always like, you know, uh, I was not expecting that when I was a kid, you know, that's something that, that, that came to me. Uh, but, but the thing is that what, what I knew that I wanted to be was uh, a scientist or I, I, I liked this career. I had no idea how I could, you know, like end up where I am today. But again, like being flexible is is important, you know. Like I, uh, it was a priority to me for me to move wherever I could, you know, like uh, earn experience and then uh, take the next step. So that's definitely important. Like be prepared, uh, be in touch or be familiar with with uh, you know, like with with the topics you like. Do not be shy. Be ready to speak up and to contact people, and and be ready to go wherever you have to go. Obviously, you have to enjoy that, but <laughs> staying home, you know, like that that that's not the way. Yeah. So so this sounds a little bit like uh, Tim with his monkey phantoms saying like no no science is wasted science. So I mean. Tim, do you have any other examples of like surprises along your career where you went from one route to something that you hadn't even planned for? Uh, most of it. <laughs> uh, you know, I um, I keep hearing from people who uh, you know talk about how when they were seven or eight years old and they had a uh, transformative experience that uh, shaped what they would do for the rest of their life. And I never felt like I had that kind of experience. I, I, I don't feel like I'm lacking for it, but it's it doesn't make sense to me. How can a seven-year-old know what a 50-year-old is going to do? Uh, when I was seven, I admit um, there were some neat things going on. When I was seven years old, uh, we got to watch Apollo 11 land on the moon to the extent that they were able to give live video of that kind of thing in, the, in those days. Uh, and... Uh, and then the liftoff from the moon uh, is a matter of family legend in our house because I came running to see the TV when my dad called me because we only had a little nine inch TV and or 13. It's not that small. And in the process, clocked myself on a door jam and so ended up watching it through a mirror while my father held my cut shut uh, so that we could watch the uh, liftoff from the moon. So there were some hints <laughs> that this might be a direction that would be interesting to go. Uh, but, you know, and, and of course, we then had the Viking landers in 76 were also, you know, fascinating. I had a big poster on my wall. It was all pretty exciting, but I really didn't know that that was what I wanted to do. Uh, I, and in many ways, I found I, I drifted along because I just I find everything interesting. So there was nothing I wanted to throw away while I said, oh, this is more interesting for me. Uh, but ultimately, when I went to college and they forced you to make choices. Oh, I'm being asked to be less enthusiastic because there are other people in the house. But as I went away to college uh, and they make you make choices. You know, I had to pick and I decided that out of the things that I was pretty good at, uh, physics was the one that looked like it was most likely to stay challenging. Uh, and so I, I went that path and uh, I followed that to graduate school uh, where I just wandered around. You know, I had been told, oh, this fellow has, uh, has room for graduate students. I went very first person I talked to. We, we talked about that for a while. I said, well, we do ultraviolet astronomy of Jupiter. You can work on that. Actually, the first thing I did for him was uh, simulating fusion plasma observations for a spectrometer. Um, and so I just kind of did this, did that, and all of a sudden I have a career. Uh, and uh, it, it doesn't always work out that way. And it's nothing against people who know what they want to do, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't prejudge it. I just went for each new opportunity that looked like I had something to offer uh, I went that direction and it was fun, you know, and somehow I went from Jupiter Aurora in the ultraviolet to Jupiter Aurora in the infrared. So I think the connection is clear. Um, but now I've ended up working on atmospheres all over the solar system in the infrared because 
It's like, well, this is cool, but come on, look at what's going on at Mars. Now that's interesting. And hey, Venus has stuff going on. Uh, and then, you know, they, we, we were hitting a little bit of a dry patch in that. I talked to somebody at the uh, Friday morning coffee time. And they said, well, you know, with these discoveries of water on the moon, we could really use somebody to look at the parts of the moon that we haven't already assigned people to because they're looking at the part where we thought we'd find some water. And so all of a sudden I became a lunar scientist, something I never actually thought I had any relevant skills for. So, you know, there, drifting is not bad. <laughs> Yeah, developing a lot of different skills and interests and connections, I assume, as well. Um, and I want to circle back to that. But um, this, I think, discussion feeds into this uh, jump, Alice, that you made from research in particle physics to being the instrument lead for LIDAR for Dragonfly. Like, how did you make that jump? How did you apply? Did you have a referral? Like, what happened? Sure. So I, I, I find Her Herman's uh, response about being flexible really interesting because my career at APL was kind of born out of a different kind of flexibility. I, I drew a geographical circle, if you will, around my PhD institution and said, I, I don't want to leave this bubble. So who's going to take somebody with skills and instrumentation and data analysis and what do you want me to do? And I had a number of different job offers, including a postdoc, continuing on in my field, including a, a job doing contracting for the Army of unspecified <laughs> application. Um, what really attracted me to APL was the fact that I could do my own research. So I, I spent some time looking at how we could apply machine learning to high contrast images of exoplanets to see if there was better data analysis methods. And, you know, I plan to publish a paper on that, but at the same time, I'm an engineer on a mission. And so APL was this place where I could put my hands in a lot of different places and do a lot of different things. Cause I, I don't particularly like being pigeonholed into one thing that I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Um, so, so it's a flexibility of a different sort, right? I, I, uh, really wanted to be where I wanted to be for my personal life. That was really important to me, but I, I, I was fine applying my skills to kind of whatever came about. Um, so Dragonfly was the project that they put me on as soon as I arrived to APL. That was during phase A when we were, so Dragonfly had a competed phase A because it's a new frontiers mission. So it was us versus a comet sampling mission. Um, and we were scrambling to put together all these ideas about how are we gonna fly on Titan? Um, Cause that's, that's, I'm not part of the science team. Really what I think about is how we move on Titan which enables the science. If we don't move you, you can't do your science. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and, and then that's transitioned into the role I'm in now in phase B leading the LIDAR. Um, and so that's being built for us by Goddard actually, but I'm, I, I find myself attracted to roles in which I serve as the glue between things. Um, so when I was a particle physicist, I spent a lot of time bridging the gap between theory and experiment. And now as this kind of payload systems type role, I spend a lot of time bridging the gap between science or in this case, navigation and what, um, what engineering goes behind it to actually make it happen. Fantastic. So uh, I may I intrude for just a sec? Please do. Yes. First of all, I'm, I'm excited to see that I, I, I was Googling while she was speaking that I see that Alice and I share the same uh, graduate institution, um, although a little time apart. You know, I finished my PhD in 91. Um, I was born in 91. <laughs> <laughs> but also <clears throat> a couple of years ago, well, more than a couple of years ago, uh, I was teaching a planetary science class at University of Maryland uh, that was, we had organized it around uh, mission concepts. And I was telling my students about how, well, NASA is deciding that between uh, a CSER, a comet sampling mission to go back to the comet that Deep Impact blew a chunk out of, and Dragonfly, which is a nuclear powered octocopter to fly on Titan. So I'm just gonna ask you, 
What do you think NASA is going to select? Important comet sample mission, nuclear powered octocopter. And, you know, not surprisingly, everybody agreed uh, nuclear powered octocopter is the coolest mission description you can come up with. It almost seems like someone just grabbed like words out of a cool hat. <laughs> like, we're oh, do this. Ralph has been working on that for a long time. <laughs> There was a question that we had and others have also posted that I wanted to kind of circle back on and have everybody talk really briefly about, about networking. It, I've been hearing about connections, about people having people who they knew, who helped guide them in their careers or who gave them their foot in the door, that sort of thing. What, um, what role has networking played in your career and what recommendations do you have for people who want to know how to network and how to, how to kind of start to get their foot in the door in terms of opportunities out there. Does anyone want to go first and jump in here? Alice, please. I can jump in. Um, networking has played a huge role. I, I, so I came from a rural town in Nevada. I didn't have a whole lot of resources, so I, I kind of got to college on my own. But after that, uh, pretty much everywhere I've gotten since has often been because of networking. Um, so I do think, I do think it plays a, a pretty instrumental role. I also think I'm fortunate to be a relatively socially comfortable individual who doesn't mind approaching strangers and talking to them. So, um, I do think that networking can be easier for some people and harder for some people. And I think as people in positions already on missions, I think it's, it would behoove us to make sure that we're also reaching out so that we reach a wide breadth of people uh, who have different comfortable levels so that, that we're really leveling that playing field and making sure there's opportunities for people of all networking skill levels. Thanks, Alice. Yeah, if, if I may go next, I, I also think that networking is fundamental, critical, instrumental, uh, <clears throat> networking is really, really important, but but you don't have to think of, oh, it, it's that important, but then I, I don't know the people or it might be hard for me to, to, to build that networking. I, I think that's something that you can do in, in um, what, what I would always recommend is like, uh, don't, don't be shy in general, you know, like if, uh, if you want something, uh, you, you never know, like feel free to send emails to, to, to people you might to collaborate with. Uh, if you happen to go to conferences, uh, feel free or, or not feel free to like talk, talk, talk to everyone really. Uh, or if you are in your, you know, like in your college, talk to the professors that are doing a research you are interested in. Um, so basically build your networking by by not being shy and and, and obviously uh, what is very important in my opinion is uh, in addition to networking you you have to be efficient in other words if you are working with someone with your advisor or supervisor or or, or mentor if you're doing a great job he or she will put a great word on you you know and 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 you know it, it's super important to have efficient people, to have people that actually do the job. So by, by being efficient and by, by working nicely with your mentors, advisors, or whatever, and by not being shy, that's how you will, you know, like, like grow your, your network and you will need that. So, so that's important. So, <clears throat> so uh, I, I agree. Thank you. Um, one of the things that, um, uh, helped me out was was uh, going to um, conferences very early on, and um, I attended a, a meeting uh, when I was an undergraduate, and uh, it was very exciting to go and listen to people. So that's that's the chance you have to go up and talk to people. And I asked I asked some people where I should go to graduate school, for example, and got some good advice. Uh, so um, it's a lot easier today to reach out and 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 be involved in virtual meetings and. And most, most places have at least relatively low cost student, uh, student uh, fees for attending uh, uh, conferences, but 
that's a good way to network and the, the social events at those kinds of meetings. You make a note of, oh, I really want to talk to that person and find them later and talk to them. And uh, so, so uh, that, that, that is an important part of, of the networking as well. And I'd like to jump in too, because I've been watching a conversation going on among several people in the chat that was uh, started by uh, Kiana Jardine about uh, how do you network if you're an introvert? Um, so uh, let me speak as a representative of, of that group of people. <laughs> um, because even though I, I get loud and boisterous on this kind of thing, and in some ways it's because uh, I don't know how to uh, make myself be quieter. Uh, and, you know, and then I get scolded for it. But what I'm getting at is I have had to teach myself and I didn't really start doing it actively until I was in my mid thirties on how to, uh, how to be more outgoing. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, so at the earlier stage though, cause my career started before I was in my mid thirties, uh, how did things work? Uh, one way um, is uh, at the at the undergraduate and graduate level uh, is just to get to know your faculty members. You know, as an undergraduate, just talking to people after class uh, about what you found interesting and in the classes you were in will make you a person that the faculty are aware of, and that is a thing that will help you later on. Um, doing undergraduate research is great, but I know when I was an undergraduate. Uh, I was very embarrassed and shy about going and talking to faculty members about that sort of thing. So another thing I think a lot of people don't realize is uh, faculty are desperate for you to come ask them questions. Uh, undergraduates just don't understand how much faculty really want you to come to office hours, to come talk to them. Um, so that they can actually have the opportunity, instead of just talking to 300 students, uh, to actually talk to a person about a subject that they're passionate about. Uh, we wouldn't be in this if we didn't care. There's lots of better ways to make a buck. Um, we're doing this because we're passionate about what we're doing, because it's exciting to learn new things about the world. And the opportunity to talk to somebody directly uh, is just wonderful. So yeah talk to your faculty members, take advantage of office hours. They want you to do it. They, they, they're they embarrassed to say, actually, some of them will say so and you don't believe them, do it. And at the graduate level, again, it's, you know, go, go to those colloquium chats, talk with people, uh, just take an interest in what other people are talking about and see if you can come up with a question or two, especially at the end of the colloquium, uh, because these get people to notice that person's sharp. They're paying attention to what people outside their field are talking about too. You know, they're, they're, they're thinking about this stuff. That is, is the way you get started. And it, it, it grows from there. Um, so I have one more comment because I've been reading the chat and people are wondering how to get involved in research. And I remember sitting around a campfire in my first geology field trip asking the professors, how do you do research? <laughs> they all laughed. So um, the, it's curiosity. You, you want to become curious about things. And um, uh, so I just gave a, I gave a short presentation to the uh, KimCam team about the geology that I can see outside my window from my, my home office here, because it's relevant to the, uh, uh, to the material that we're seeing coming down so coming down the arroyo, I have an arroyo outside my, my window. And, and so um, the layers the layers exposed in a new, uh, a new road cut over across the way uh, were, were really interesting. I'm going, wait, that looks kind of like what I just saw on Mars coming down from our, from our camera. So you have to be curious. And, and one of the best ways that, uh, that you guys can, can all get involved and start focusing on things is reading papers. And it's, it's not, sometimes it's hard at first, things go flying over your head. Find the stuff that's interesting, but but uh, you know you can you can access a lot of the literature and the abstracts. The lunar planetary science uh, has millions of <laughs> it's really cool abstracts available to read, uh, and they are short form. Uh, uh, and so, this also pay attention to who the authors are and where the authors are located. 
that's the other part of it. So if you read an interesting thing, you say, oh, that person's at you know, University of Arizona or University of New Mexico or wherever. Um, uh, that's how you can start developing an idea of what's going on. Uh, so, so make the effort, uh, even though it can be hard to read the original literature, don't just rely on the uh, on reading the uh, on on reading the summaries, which often are not they're 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 sometimes okay, but you know you, you really got to get into the actual papers and and find out what's what makes you excited. And and don't be too discouraged as some of them are a bit opaque. I do have a few colleagues whose papers are unintelligible to people with 30 years experience. <laughs> if you ever find yourself talking to someone and you don't know what they're talking about, that's really okay to ask um, and to have them explain it to you. Saying, I don't know, is a really important part of science, I have found. And someone also up in the chat a while earlier said that they were, they were worried about uh, I think they were asking which classes to take and they were worried about picking the wrong ones and messing up. And I think that as long as you're building skills, um, science is all about failure. So. Controlled <laughs> failure. Controlled failure. Yeah, learning from failure. The one thing is, um, uh, the piece of advice I have and I tell students all the time is, if you're really over your head in a class, drop it, go back, take a, take a lower level, I made the mistake of taking an advanced statistics class instead of the basic st statistics. It was all about probability theory, and I had no clue what that was all about. So, so this gets back to uh, you know the, the sort of the failure idea. We we had a chat about this <laughs> uh, yesterday, but um, uh, <clears throat> you know uh, re restart. Don't think oh I must be dumb because I don't understand this. Go back. It's it's usually because you don't have the background. You got to go back and start at a lower level and then catch up. Uh, but that's that's a, an important thing. And then the other part of it is, um, don't think that your classwork ends when you're done. You don't throw the book away, sell it, and you're done, burn all your notes. Um, everything you learn in introductory material, you will need in the future. Remember your mineralogy, remember your basic physics, um, and, and, and review that stuff every now and then. It actually will come back uh, uh, many of you will be taking PhD comps in the future, and you will <laughs> you'll be asked and be expected to know a lot of basic information. So don't don't just think that oh, I finished that class, I can forget everything I learned. <laughs> so we've only got about five minutes left, and of course there's a million questions. We're not going to be able to answer all of them. Grace, do you want to pick one or two that you think are are critical. I just posted in the uh, chat some information about the dragonfly opportunity that's out right now, mm -hmm. and um, and that's in that's one of the things that's in the resource packet. More information about that. But Grace, yeah. So I'll just reiterate a bunch of the questions are you know I'm international or I'm a high school student. What are the resources I could have access to? Go through the resource document. If you're a high schooler, like look for that little section at the bottom left. If it lists you, check it out. A bunch of the databases that are highlighted in gray, those you can go search by your academic level and those have so much information. And then you can always email us if you have questions. Um, so we are gonna run out of time. We're not gonna be able to get to all of your awesome questions. I'm sorry about that, um, but our panel has been amazing and they've, I think, very much emphasized getting research experience, being flexible and curious and networking with this community that is actually very broad and interdisciplinary. So there's a lot of opportunities to do that, whether it's by going to conferences or just reaching out by email. Um, this webinar has been recorded and many of our panelists shared their email on their opening slides. So if you didn't get those, you can go find the recording online and you can find their emails and reach out to them if you have questions. Um, Horton, did you have something? Uh, yes, international. And uh, so we have, I'm on there. Uh, Spain, uh, France um, has, France has amazing opportunities um, out there right now. I'm sure, I think there's opportunities in, uh, you know, throughout Europe, Germany, France, Spain, Italy. Um, uh, and in India, um, I'm collaborating with people in India all the time. 
at Ahmedabad at the uh, uh, research center there. There's just, you have to pay attention and you gotta float to the top, of course. So, um, uh, but uh, the, 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 it's dramatically different than uh, a few decades ago. There's a huge amount of international uh, work going on and you may have to dig a little bit. It's not, you can't just, if you Google it, it's gonna show you NASA sites. You may have to dig a little deeper to find some of the international stuff. Yeah, and a lot of the international opportunities are not currently in the resource packet, but this is gonna keep growing. We will have two more events in this series, the Road to Mission Science. One is gonna be in July, one will be in September. Those will be announced soon. So check out the LPI site. There's also information about signing up for the newsletter on the front page of the resource packet. I feel like a total broken record. <laughs> um, but let's see, so don't run off yet. We have a couple of poll questions for you. Um, and is there anything else I'm forgetting? Christine. Good luck, everybody. Um, so yeah, we're gonna ask you some poll questions, but in addition to that, we wanted to um, let you know, for those of you who are interested in more specific things about some of the different missions, we periodically have a focus on a mission or a topic within planetary science. Those talks are called cosmic explorations. We have one this Thursday, so Thursday evening, uh, we have one and I'll be putting the link to that in the chat or that window will be popping up at the end. And that one is focusing on the James Webb Space Telescope and planetary science that's going to be upcoming in the James Webb Space Telescope for this, this Thursday night. And the others are recorded as well. Um, Grace, do you wanna go ahead and put launch the poll? I'm having trouble. It has, yeah, so the poll is launched. Um, there's a couple of questions here. So thank you for your patience. The first one is um, just a quick short answer. You can maybe just say one or two words or you can skip it, but asking what was the most impactful thing you heard today? Um, what, the second question is what was most useful about the seminar? And I've just provided some options, not exhaustive. And then the final two questions are asking about how you feel in terms of your um, preparedness and your knowledge in terms of pursuing um, planetary science opportunities. So please take a minute and fill that out. Like I said, this is the first event in a series of three. And we really want to improve these and make them the most useful that they can be for our audience. So your feedback is very helpful. Additionally, um, when we end the webinar or you leave, you'll be sent to a survey. You do not have to fill out the survey, but your responses are very, very useful to us. So any feedback you can provide is very much appreciated. I'm going to close the polls in about 10 more seconds. And three, two, one. Thank you all for participating. Um, I'm gonna put up a little bit of information real quick. Thank you all for your questions. Um, for some of these, we'll hopefully be able to capture them in future events. So, um, and we try to put all of these on, online. So everyone, please join us in thanking our speakers today. Um, we really appreciate their time. And please thank you for joining us. We know that you're busy. We know that it's a busy time of year, a busy month. Some of you are joining us in the middle of the night. <laughs> Um, go back to bed, get some sleep. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes, thank you all. Panel, if you can stay on for like one more minute. Um, but everyone else who attended, thank you so much for coming. We hope to see you next time. Um, sign up for our newsletter. Come to our public lecture on Thursday. The ad is right here. Learn all about the James Webb. Um, yeah. Bye, everybody. <laughs>